Hello everyone. Welcome to this PyCon 2020 talk titled as Saved by In Memory NoSQL, a hitchhiker guide to black box debugging of Python production code. Sorry about long title, but I believe by the end of this talk, you will understand all of it. So before we go ahead, something about me. My name is Deepak K. Gupta. I am a tech consultant and software crafter. I'm working in this industry for more than 20 years. And these are some social media handles where you can reach out to me. So let's go ahead and start. Let's first talk about black box. Now, whenever you hear the term black box, what comes to your mind? The picture of an airplane. Because black boxes are generally associated with airplane and black box debugging is actually inspired by black boxes that are there in an airplane. So the airplane black boxes are extremely durable hardware. It is made to survive extremely harsh conditions it has all the information about the running system in real time and those informations are encoded in nature which means that if someone gets the black box it is not possible for that person to take the black box and decode all the information and that's the reason we have specialized labs across the world to decode these informations and the reason for existence of black box is this in software this can happen quite often that you know something goes wrong in the production system and we are trying to find the root cause of it. We are not able to find it. We patch the production system with additional logs within the area which we feel that is the root cause of the problem. And we expect the problem to reoccur again so that we can get more information. And we just believe that these logs will be able to help us in finding the root cause. That option is not there in an airplane. So in black box debugging, we wanted to come up with something similar where we rarely need to patch the existing production system to find the root cause of a problem. And here is how the black box architecture looks like. It's extremely simple. There is a separate entity called black box, which is totally separate and it doesn't impact the performance of any of the existing components. It just get the data, get the real time data about component performance. Like there are thousands of components in an airplane they put their real-time data into the black box. Their functionality is not dependent upon the black box. So let's talk about how come Python and black box comes into picture. So we were building a system with complex set of state machines with hundreds of states, events and transitions. So if you are building a system like this, you know that there is no happy path. Happy path means these are not set of states uh, that will happen most of the time. It depends totally upon the end user behavior and environmental circumstances and the permutation and combination of these state events and transitions are kind of limitless. You know, it's very difficult to understand when something happened in this state or because of this event, what leads to triggering of this state and how many things happen and what leads to this particular state. That's the reason we wanted to have a black box like feature so that each and every state activity events and transitions are actually recorded. And with the recorded log, we wanted to generate a visual sequence and activity diagram for the complete system so that it can help us in understanding what happened within the system. And of course, the tool would be sophisticated so that if we tell them to generate visual diagram from this to this time frame or top level or detail level, it will be able to do that. And these logs will be released as part of production builds. Now, it's a general practice that when we at logs, we have different types of log like info log, debug log, critical logs. And it's also a general practice that when we are giving the system to production, we just enable critical logs, of course, because of the performance regions. And we do not enable info and debug logs. OK, now let's talk about the code which we were writing the state machine. It's a very miniature version of my state machine. And I just wanted to give you a taste of the system, how it looks like. So we had state and event as an abstract base classes and we had a state machine. This is not the original code. This is just a miniature version of a state machine. Just to give you an idea how this was actually working. So state machine starts with state. It transitioned to next state. There were multiple state machine, inner state machines and all those complexities were built into the system. So to understand the working of the system, let's talk about a very simple real time example. So we are in a happy state right now. Happy state is also in a state and we received an event called lost money. God forbid, but we received this event and we moved to sad state. 
we again received an event called gain money and we moved back to happy state. So this is the very simple description of how state machine work. But when we generated the log, we didn't want it to write in log that, you know, I'm in happy state, I lost money, I'm moving to sad state. I'm in sad state, I gain money, I'm moving to happy state. No, what we wanted to do is something similar to what black boxes does is that we wanted to have a encoded information, encoded logs and for that, we created a mapping table, something very similar to this, like, you know, happy state will be represented by one, sad by two, gain and lost money will be represented by Roman one and two. And once the log file will be generated, here is how the log file will look like. It will be a jumbled sequence of some characters, numbers, and nobody will be able to make any sense of it because they cannot decode it. And that was extremely beneficial for us because we are generating locks in a production system and even if someone accidentally or deliberately get access to these logs it is not possible for them to decode it the other benefit is that you know it reduces the log size instead of writing plain text if you write jumbled encoded short information it will reduce the log size so this is how logs will be generated but to do a black box debugging just generating logs are not enough we need a complete infrastructure at our end. We need data structure, storage format, mapping table, decoding logic, visualization tool. Basically, we have to build a complete system at our end where we can feed in logs and we get the sequence and activity diagrams out of it. Okay, so we needed to build a complete system. It was complex, but it was kind of one time job, but we needed to build something to be able to see these logs. Otherwise, it's very difficult to manually decode it and try to get sense of it. So that was the complete idea of black box debugging. I know you might be thinking it's a smart idea and you also know that it will work. If we get all the information, it will be easy for us to reconstruct based on the information which we already have. But as the saying goes, ideas are good, execution is everything. When we thought about black box debugging, the biggest question that came to our mind is about performance. You might have also guessed that performance would be a huge issue and we needed disk writes to happen to be able to persist the log, whether it is a file write or database write, we needed to write it onto the disk and it's a huge performance issue, especially when we want to write such a huge amount of logs. Now, we also looked into some of the existing logging strategies used by various systems and people. Some of them are called ring buffer, circular buffer, where logs are actually kept in memory before writing it onto the disk. So which means that if you have a circular buffer for let's say one MB size, you will wait for one MB to fill before writing it into the disk. But for us, this was a problem. We cannot do that because to be able to behave like black boxes, we needed real time logs, especially for state transition and events. So if an event is being triggered, we need to write that log. Because if something goes wrong at that time, we will lose that information, which means that we need some of the things to be written in real time. Of course, there were few things which can hold on for a while, but state transition and receiving an event is something we needed to be present in real time. So here is how the architecture of our black box debugging looks like. We had a totally different dedicated server reachable via TCP for the logging and we had our production code running in a different place. So the different place could be our own servers or some of the servers in the cloud. They are in a totally different space and this dedicated log server is in a different space. So far so good, but we were still skeptical whether this could work. So what we did is that, you know, we gave it a first try with file write. I mean, receiving the TCP socket buffer and writing it into a file. And as you might have guessed, it took lots of time and it was expected also. Second was SQL database write. And of course it was better than file writes because it totally depends upon how you create the schema, whether you can use async and other options. Now, one thing for us, reading was not an issue. So creation of joins to read data was not an issue for us because we didn't want it to read in real time. For us, writing the logs was the biggest thing. It was better, but still not up to the mark as far as performance is concerned. 
So we gave it a third try with a NoSQL database, right? It was generally better, but not always. So again, it depends upon the type of data you want to use and depends upon how you put the data, how you rearrange the data. So basically data engineering matters over here. Now I am not taking the name of SQL and NoSQL databases because we are not judging the database. We are not benchmarking them. What we had is a different kind of problem which we were trying to solve. It has nothing to do with the capability or usability of our database. So this is how it looked like, but still the performance was an issue. Now the performance impact was still beyond acceptable limit. So we were in verge of discarding this idea. Before that, we thought of trying NoSQL in-memory database rights. So in-memory databases were not the first choice because it is limited by the memory of the system, which is much, much lesser as compared to disk space of the system. So it was not possible for us to store all the data in the memory. So we came up with a trick. What we did is that, you know, we allowed NoSQL in-memory database to listen to the TCP connection and receive all the logs and store it. And what we did is that we run a batch system uh, behind the scenes, which will trigger after some time or when the memory usage goes beyond an acceptable limit, it will run, it will put the data into a persistent disk store. So in that way, this was working. So finally, this gave us some of the acceptable performance limit. Now one caveat, if you just replace your, you know, disk database with in-memory database and expect a huge performance gain, this is not going to happen. You need to engineer how you want to store data in in-memory database also. Because data structures, if they start taking more time, it will negate the benefits of in-memory database. So we didn't got perfect results in first go. We had to do some kind of data engineering. Now, this was in acceptable limits, but we thought that, you know, can we improve the performance a bit more? We came up with an idea and it actually indeed improved the performance. So the optimization is that our production code is running into different servers, maybe in cloud, maybe in our own uh, premise. What we did is that we created a instance of in-memory DB within that server itself. So logs will be written in this in-memory DB within that server where the production code is running and there will be a batch job which will take the data from this in-memory and transfer it into a physical database. So this batch job will be running in each and every um, server. Now I would like to share one observation and that's a very important information. So within a server, the communication will be fast. But if we replaced in-memory DB with another disk DB, the performance difference is sometimes negligible and it exactly depends upon the kind of data we are writing, amount of data we are writing. Especially if you are using some SSDs, the performance difference is non-countable for a small amount of data. But we had to end up using in-memory DB because, you know, in a disk DB, uh, you need to write it on the disk as well as read from the disk so that your bad job can transfer it onto a physical DB. In in-memory DB, you have to read from the memory itself, which is again a bit faster. So overall, it turned out to be faster. So that's all what we did. And I hope that I was able to explain you in this particular talk. Now, before I close some caution about black box debugging, it's generally a very complex undertaking. So you are just creating a short live, a small project. Maybe it's not a best idea to use this particular thing. It is good for long term or critical system. Again, even if you are writing in memory, it will take some time, even if nanosecond, millisecond, but it will take some time. And if you can afford that, it's a good idea to write all those logs. It will help you not only in understanding the problems in the production system, but will also help you in understanding the behavior of the system, which you can look and think about optimizing it. Third and final thing, this is not limited to just Python. You can use this particular idea of black box debugging in almost any programming language and all the database provides driver to write in it from any other programming language, including in memory database. So that's all I had for this particular talk. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you PyCon 2020 for providing this opportunity. Thanks a lot. Good day. Take care.